and I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof no man in heaven nor on earth neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon when I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book neither to look thereon one of the elders said unto me weep not behold the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David had prevailed he has prevailed in order for a man to open the book of the testament of your family and isolate the anointing, the oil that was supposed to drive that, that family into destiny. A man must prevail. I will not stop until I prevail. Make that your prayer tonight. I will not stop. I know it's turbulent. The volcano has come to distract. The tempest has come to isolate. But in order for the books to be open, a man must prevail. Father, we are that generation that have become restless. The yoke upon our shoulders must be broken. Weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah. On the root of David, he has prevailed. sons of one skiver a Jew and chief of chief of the priests which did so and the evil spirit answered and said Jesus I know and Paul I know but who are ye that means even the devil has a record of prevailing people in his archives Jesus I know he prevailed Paul I know your name is not on the list <laughs> you don't have authority to operate in these parts we have not heard of you Jesus I know Paul I know we will not stop until the devil knows we came to until hell is aware that we have made an appearance And the man in whom this evil spirit was leaped upon them and overcame them and prevailed against them. Because the guys had no identity in the spirit, the demon spirit did what? It's as if the battle in the realm is to secure the prevailing dominion. He prevailed against them, he didn't leave them the same. He, he, he beat them and left them naked and wounded. Now, you see, this was an event that took place in Ephesus. Ephesus was the land of idolatry. 
there were all kinds of, of altars raised in the name of different kinds of spirit. This was the land that Paul entered and called them a, a bunch of superstitious people. In fact, they had an altar erected to a God that was an unknown God. Just in case we miss the list, just in case there's one left out. Let's erect. Now, it was in the same land of idolatry where Paul passed by. And, and it was that place where the sons of Sceva tried to cast out devils. All right? Are you with me? Now, on the account of what happened, they saw demons speak and identify that we know Jesus. Demons spoke and said, We know Paul. When the people heard it, guess what happened? And this was known in all among all the Jews and to the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many believed. And confessed and showed their deeds. I'm talking about this man trying to cast out devils. He did not prevail. The demon spoke and gave credence to Jesus and Paul. People heard it. The news spread. And it's not, it was not a miracle that took place. It was a testimony that came from the demonic realm. That came into the city. And fear came upon the entire land. I mean, a city of idolatrous people. All right. It was so much that the wind of God seized the place, the conviction of the Holy Ghost seized the place, so much that the Bible revealed that many that used curious books, many also which use curious arts, brought their books together. I'm talking of diviners and necromancers, enchanters that had books in their archives that they consulted in order to, to bring... Um, or put together the accurate alignment of sorcery, of, of divination, of, of, of necromancy. They gathered their stock and they burnt them. And the Bible says, so mighty grew the word of God that it what? <laughs> so mightily grew the word of God that it prevail. Now if at any point in time you get to forget what God has told you, the word that he has given you, you are not worthy to stand before him. Because the most, if you, you cannot understand the manifestation of the spirit of God until you understand the manifestation of the word of God. How does the word of God manifest? And so the Bible says in that city, the mightily grew the word of God that it prevailed. Can we pray for Nigeria and say, God, there's so much preaching around. But let the word of the kingdom grow mightily and prevail and conquer. Let it conquer the, the principality of the occult that has besieged our nation. Let it conquer the principality of corruption that has crippled our destiny as a corporate people outlined and pedestal by prophecy a people favored by God crippled by the enemy let the word of God and his counsel prevail among us as a nation as a people in the name of Jesus Christ Let us see Let that great concept prevail. Let the word of God, the voice of God prevail in Nigeria. Let it prevail against the power of the occult. Let it prevail against divination. Let it prevail against enchantment. Let the new born destiny of this nation, of this land rise out of obscurity let the hand of God conquer that which seeks to manipulate the soul of our nation and to compromise the stature of our corporate persona how that we call upon you today we give you praise 
give you glory. We honor you. In Jesus' name. It's needful for us to understand that a man's life is shaped by the spiritual deposit that is laid upon him. Now on the strength of the deposit that was laid upon Abraham, his life was factored and fashioned in such a way that he could not but live by faith. Now it was the deposit that shaped his life that way. Every time he stepped out of faith, he created, he sped up a beast. Are you with me? Oh, you are not with me. Uh, okay, let me use this evening to explain what I mean. You are welcome. You may be seated. Amen. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. We will seek his face for utterance. Now the issues he wants to raise among us are critical issues. And I ask him for utterance, for access and for utterance, for penetration and for wisdom. Hallelujah. And please, uh, sister, please bring my board, okay? Bring my board. Now, whilst my board is coming, I'd like us to go back to the scripture where we started from in the book of Job chapter 28. I want to spend this evening to teach at least for one hour, 30 minutes. Then we'll pray thereafter. Job chapter 28. I'll be making reference to this scripture once and again so that we'll not lose sight the emphasis of the spirit. Since the year began, we have been looking at the basics of Christianity. The basics of Christianity. And um, as we are advancing in this emphasis, there are some salient points that I want us to pick as we, we move along. Now, our anchor scripture is in the book of Job chapter 28 verse 7. He said, there is a part which no fowl knoweth, and the vulture's eye has not seen. The lion's worms have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. He put forth his hand upon the rock, he overturned the mountains by the roots. He cut it out rivers among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He binded the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're able to see that that part, such a part that could not be seen by the vulture, could not be accessed by the lion could not be accessed by the fowl, could not be accessed by the, wrong, the, the young lion. It's a part that exists not in the natural, but exists in the supernatural. And that's where we got the title or the topic that we have been handling, the part of spiritual progress. Now, we saw the first point on the part of spiritual progress is the knowing of revelation. The knowing of revelation. There is an educational system that God wants to bring us into. I'm talking about a knowledge that you cannot learn. I'm talking about a knowing that you cannot be taught. It's a knowledge and a knowing that is revealed, is handed out to you, my God. Those are the foundations upon which our life with God is based. In fact, your salvation, the efficacy of your salvation it's as a result of the witness of a spirit that resides within you. But the Bible says that the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
Now that witness is the knowing that comes by revelation. It's handed out to you. Handed out to you from God. And in spiritual things and in building your spiritual life, you have to lay hold on the things that God quickens you to know by His Spirit. Are you with me? Now it's not carnal knowledge, it's revealed knowledge. And so we, we saw that. Hallelujah. And then secondly, we now discover that on the path of spiritual progress, we are all going to learn how to walk by the Spirit. Alright? To walk by the Spirit. That's where we stopped. Uh, I'm going to emphasize that a lot because the average Christian these days doesn't know what it means to walk by the Spirit. Reduce my volume, please. So because of that, I wrote some scriptures out here. And I want to encourage us to study tonight before we come for tomorrow's lecture. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 to Romans chapter 6 verse 23. We saw that the book of Romans is not a message, it's a map. It's a map that shows our placement and the, our coordinates on the path of spiritual progress. Now, if you read and you study the book of Romans accurately, you should be able to detect where you are on the map. And you should be able to detect what you need to do from that point in order to, for you to advance to the next point on the path. Now, so the book of Romans is what? It's a map. So when we say there is a path that no foul knows, the path that we are talking about is captured in that book called Romans. Are you with me? I, I say, are you here? Yes, sir. Now, you see, we have a long way to go. I don't want to rush. And the things are simple, but they are technical. You will not make any reasonable spiritual progress if you don't have these things at your fingertips. And God wants us to look at it tonight. Amen? Amen? Now as we advance, this may be the only night I may have the opportunity to teach like this. I don't know what God wants to do tomorrow or what he wants to do on Sunday. But as my custom is, I want us to understand why we are gathered. Amen? Amen. Now in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 5 verse 12 to Romans chapter 6 verse 23 the, the, the subject or what is treated within that strand of scripture is in Adam and in Christ. In Romans chapter 7 verse 1 to Romans chapter 8 verse 39 you can go and read it yourself. What is covered within that strand of scripture is in the flesh and in the spirit. Are you with me? Now, this is number one and this is number two. Have you written that down? Amen? We're in a lecture now. We're in a lecture room now. Can you see my board? You can't see my board from here. Okay, let me read what is on my board. I says, from Romans chapter 5 verse 12 to Romans chapter 6 verse 23, that stretch of scripture shows what is in Adam and in Christ. Just like a fish. A fish can only operate in water. If you take a fish out of the habitat of its existence, it's going to choke and die. We must understand the habitat for the Christian. The habitat for the Christian is in Christ. But nevertheless, the Christian is a complex personality. Very complex personality. If we had time, I would have shown you how that the divine life is in your spirit as a Christian. How that human life is in your soul as a Christian. And how that satanic life, which is what we call sin, is in your body as a Christian. And because of that, you can actually live on three different planes. Your most conscious plane of existence defines your status and your spiritual standing. So you can be a Christian that is more conscious of your body. You will be a slave to sin. 
You can be a Christian and you are more conscious of you. It means that you are operating within the scope of human life. If you are a Christian and you are more conscious of God, it means you have latched on to divine life. Because the proof of life is consciousness. And the divine life that is in your spirit gives you the consciousness of the realm of God. Are you with me? The human life that is in your soul gives you the consciousness of you. And when you see people that almost all they do is geared towards satisfying me, that man is operating on a particular plane. And you can live all your life on that plane. Me. The reason why he wants a car is so that he will not appear to be failing. All right? He wants to look successful. So he has an appetite for something that will add to the sense of his being so that he doesn't look like someone that is failing. That is a testimony that is coming from human life. Most of us, especially in this day where accurate discipleship is no longer done in the body of Christ, Because discipleship is not a scholastic venture. It's not a structured venture that we can go through a particular manual and achieve. If that's what you are doing, you yourself, you are, you are deceptive. You could not put Jesus' ministry within the context and the scope of the ministries of the Pharisees. Because Jesus' ministry was a dimension that was not intellectual. Are you with me? It's not something that was intellectual. So you cannot structure it out and put it in a Bible school. Let us run this scope and run that scope. Discipleship is bringing people to know God and supervising their work with God until they become accurate. If you have a prophetic ministry and you don't have senior people over your life that are deeper and more accurate in picking things from the realm of God, and you run with the visions that you begin to receive without submitting it to someone that is higher in the ranking, you will never end up having an accurate prophetic ministry. Alright? So in discipleship, we lead people to come into contact with God and we oversee the activity with God, correcting the excesses and cutting the flesh out of the picture until a spiritual man is born through process. It's not a set of teachings. I've, I've seen some of the most carnal people, Christians I've seen, came out of discipleship programs and schemes. So there is a code of conduct that if you can align with, you will be acknowledged to be a spiritual man. Sorry if I offend you. Sorry. These words are coming from the Lord. Now, I need to tell you something. I went to Bible school very early. As at 1994, I was a graduate from Bible school. And I preached bad. In fact, I was recommended. But I was a carnal man. I didn't know Jesus. But I preached for five years. I was recommended. I had invitations. I became popular. That's the reason why I feel the responsibility to do the thing that I'm doing now. Because it's possible for you to be a preacher and you have been preaching long and you don't even know the part of spiritual progress. You don't know God. And one thing about God is that encountering Him doesn't necessarily need to be spectacular. We must understand what is supernatural and we must differentiate it from what is spectacular. The average Christian has a right in God to know his God. And that's what the fivefold ministry is set to do, to make us grow in Him to that point where we attain maturity. And we can represent him in every context. A bad husband is a bad man. A bad wife is a bad woman. A bad pastor is a bad man. I know you don't believe what I'm saying. It, maybe you are bad. That's why it's not you are not. So when the man is a, a bad governor is a bad man. All right. Many people came to me and said, "What's the secret of marital bliss?" I say, "Are you a Christian? Just be a Christian." If you are a Christian, that's all. And you are an accurate Christian as prescribed by... You see, we are short of Christians now. We are short of Christians now. It is possible for us to tell the music people, oh yeah, 
sing, we will begin to do miracles. I found out that miracles cannot produce a Christian. As much as we believe in the prophetic and the power ministry, those ministries have come to confirm the word of God. So we must put the word of God on ground. That's a food for the spirit of men. Are you with me? So because after you preach, I felt glory. We could, but if we keep on opening the website like that and people are not being instructed to become like us, we are fake too. Because a time we come when we grow in God to a level and the next person around is so far, it's not supposed to be like that. Yes, sir. A time came where the apostles could do the same miracles that Jesus was doing. He, he will send them out and he was at ease. If what I'm doing is not charm, I should be able to instruct somebody else, just like somebody doing apprenticeship. He should be able to learn the ways and become strong. And he can function in it. It's only in, in, in masonry and secret courts that what you are doing is a secret. So we should be able to teach everybody so that the least among us can become as strong as David. If that is no longer available in the church in Nigeria, it means that something has happened to the, to the church to cripple it and to cut off the possibility of reproduction. So people will not have stature sufficient to hold up mantles of men that have become old. Are you with me? Now, so we need to do what we are doing. So that discipleship is not... We have attended all those kind of scholastic schools. And I preached on it. I was recommended by the teachers. But I did not know God. I preached for 10 years as a Bible school graduate before I encountered God. Hallelujah. Now, okay. Maybe we'll do some practical somewhere along the line. That will help us understand better. Now, so, in Romans chapter 5 verse 12... To Romans chapter 6 verse 23 the, the stretch of scripture that I've just outlined speak about what obtains in Adam and what obtains in Christ in Romans chapter 7 verse 1 to Romans chapter 8 verse 39 this stretch of scripture speaks about what is obtainable in the flesh and what is obtainable in the spirit don't forget that we're on the second part of spiritual point on the part of spiritual progress which is walking in the spirit now you cannot walk in the spirit efficiently if you don't understand what the flesh is. Because you are either walking in the spirit or in the flesh. So we need to understand what the flesh is, how to identify it, and how to refuse to yield to the flesh. Now, this first set of scriptures that I just wrote out in Adam, in Christ, it is it's a revelation of positional realities. Positional. This is a revelation of what experiential reality is. So what I'm saying is this. If you are operating in the flesh, you are actually in Adam. You are operating from Adam. If you are operating in the spirit, you are actually operating from Christ. Because the realities that find expression in Christ do not function in terms of flesh. They function in terms of spirit. Are you with me? Now, when I said that in Adam and in Christ refers to a positional reality. Are you with me now? Now, positional in Adam, these are positioned by nature. In Christ, these are positioned by faith. Now, so we have two things that are conflicting here. Nature and faith. In Adam, we are functioning by our position in nature. In Christ, we are functioning what? By our position in faith. In the flesh, we are operating by our position in nature. In the spirit, we are operating by our position where? In faith. We need to understand that when faith is born, a different set of possibilities become available to us. A different set of potentials become available to us. We can now function in a plane that is beyond the scope of nature. In fact, the realm of faith or the realm of the spirit is a realm that has its own educational system. 
if you are not educated in that realm, and you are not going to be educated in that realm by any structured classroom, you are going to ed be educated in that realm by the teacher in that realm. That realm has its own instructor. Now, if I take you to the book of Hebrews, hallelujah. Now, I'm going to teach us a few things, and maybe we'll, if we have time, we'll practice it. It's something you can do on the streets. I was in the airport just going to board my, the plane, and I saw a crippled person. And there was an, a move inside to raise the cripple. Now, I'm, I'll stop there. We'll, we'll continue later. When I, when I come to... See, those realities are constant realities. Nature and faith. They are simultaneously real. It depends on which realm you want to latch upon and which realm you intend to function with. Amen? The spirit realm is not distant from you. It's not, the spirit realm is where you are sitting. It's so blended with the natural realm that there is no boundary. Nevertheless, it exists in another dimension. Just like if you have a transistor radio, all right, you can tune it. The radio position doesn't change. Are you with me? But you tune it, you get FM 95. You tune it, you get what? Because they exist on different frequencies. But they are present, those frequencies are coming right into your room. Are you with me? The frequencies are, they are doing what? Coming what? Right into your room. But you have to do something in order to catch the frequency of church. So the flesh is present the spirit realm is what? Present. The natural position is there. And the position that we have access to by faith is also what? Now this is it. The natural realm is insufficient. It's limited. It is, it is, it is, it can be frustrating to operate in that realm. Especially when you are confronted with a situation that is orchestrated from the realm of the spirit, all the resources from the natural realm becomes insufficient to contend with that situation. So a cause, alright, is a vehicle of spiritual power. A blessing is what? It's a vehicle of spiritual power. A promise from a spirit being is what? It's a vehicle of spiritual power. Are you with me? Healing it's a vehicle of spiritual power. You see, you cannot access those things that are spiritual from your natural endowment and from natural perspective. You are going to have to switch into the frequency of faith. That is when those things that are spiritual are accessible. Now, let me show you something. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we are going far today. And I want us to pick it gradually. Gradually. Because there is a contention here right now. Because the Bible says the key scripture of walking in the spirit is Romans chapter 8, where we read last month. And now there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The, the, the qualification is twofold. In order for me to go beyond the insufficiencies of the devil's ministry of accusation. In order for me to go beyond the scope and the torture of the tyranny that the kingdom of darkness places upon me on the account of the accusation of the devil. First of all, I need to be in Christ. And then secondly, I need to learn how to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So we have a dual responsibility. And blessed be God, those of us that have given our lives to Christ, you are in Christ. You see, you don't need to have a feeling to know that you are in Christ. Just like you, when you pass Wayek and they gave you XSC certificate, you didn't have a feeling that you had a certificate. It, you just knew you had it. Are you with me? So that's how I know that I have it. I don't need to have a feeling that I have it. But the Spirit of God in my spirit bears witness with me that I have a pact with God. And it happens to be that God is El Elyon. The God that does things in an eternal scope. So if God is doing business, any kind of business whatsoever, the scope of that business is 
eternal. If God slaps you, he, he slaps, he's slapping you eternally. And that's what I mean. If he gets into a contract, anything he does because of his stature, because of his, the energy of his existence, anything he gets involved in has a scope that is eternal. Now, the fact that the scope of what God is doing is eternal doesn't mean it will be eternal in your case. His intention was an eternal intention. His invitation was an eternal invitation. But you see, your response to it will determine whether that invitation will take that particular stature and that scope. Are you with me now? Now, so that's how things work. I need you to understand that it's either that you are operating in Christ or in Adam, which means you are either operating in the flesh or in the spirit. And that was a controversy that was captured in the book of John chapter 3. John chapter 3, Jesus was trying to educate a doctor of the law. This guy was a skillful man in the ways of the law. He had, he had earned some form of recognition based on the knowledge of the law that was handed over to Israel by Moses. In that law, he was an authority to reckon with. But you see, the problem with the man was not that he was a scholar. The problem was the realm he was operating. Jesus was operating from the realm of the spirit and trying to educate him about the spirit realm. The man was operating from the, though knowledgeable and vast, but he did not have the keys of the kingdom and he did not have the wisdom of the kingdom. So his knowledge was flat. His knowledge was not the kind of knowledge that had the capacity to bring redemption. And that's why you go to the university, you see a professor. A professor doesn't ne necessarily look wise. <laughs> he, he doesn't necessarily look. In, in most cases, there's much folly that is bound to his soul. In, much, in most cases. Because the knowledge that he has is not a blessed knowledge. It's a knowledge that comes from the mind. But the Bible speaks about the knowledge that blesses the knowledge that satisfies that is the knowledge that is revealed only through the instructor called christ it's blessed knowledge if you understand this knowledge if this knowledge comes to you it does not only make you aware of stuff it it brings ventilation and fulfillment to the core of your being it's a blessed knowledge now so is that blessed knowledge that has the capacity to transform a man from being a mortal man to be a man that men cannot understand. That blessed knowledge can transform a man that is held up by curses and all of that and then releases his destiny and all the members of his family will take account that this guy doesn't look like any of us. It's not, it's not the, the operating system that is driving us that is driving him. It's operating somewhat different from all of our family members. Hallelujah. That's the blessed knowledge. Now, there was this discussion between Jesus and, and Nicodemus. And they were talking. Say, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God because no one can do these signs that thou doest except God is with him. Now, his acknowledgement of Jesus' teaching ministry was not based on his rhetorics and his revelation and death. But there was something added to the teaching ministry that made it not natural. Because the Pharisees were teachers and instructors themselves. Because Paul was a student of Gamaliel, indicative of the fact that the Pharisees were very vast in the law and they taught it and instructed it. And in issues of controversy as touching the law, they were consulted, especially Pharisees like Gamaliel that have a long-standing experience in the ways and the wisdom of the law. They were consulted like, like, like icons in the society. Now, Nicodemus was one of those icons. And they had a group of icons that had x-rayed the ministry of Jesus. Even though that was not a ordinary or the common position of every member of the Sanhedrin. But there was a group. And it was as if he was speaking for them. And he said, we know that you, 
I teach I come from God. Not because of your revelation. Not because of... The, you say strange things. We, you know, many times it's difficult for us to figure it out. We go back and it's like a parable to us. But there is an element that is added to your teaching ministry that separates you and puts you in your own class. There are miracles that find expression. You teach and demons begin to scream. We don't have that. We are vast in the law. But we don't seem to have that element. Even though we have made several attempts to also... <laughs> so there's an element. There's something about your dimension that separates you from us. We know that. We know that. Now, Jesus... If I were the one Nicodemus was talking to, I'd have said, well, you see, I knew that you guys would um, eventually acknowledge this fact that you came to present right now. I, I, I've been waiting for you people to say the truth. Uh, even though it's in the night you are saying it, no problem, I've been waiting. Jesus never said anything like that. Jesus didn't even salute him. Jesus said, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, from Jesus' perspective, one of the first things that should happen to you when you give your life to Christ is that your spiritual senses are switched on. Now, wait. What happens? That means consciousness of another realm begins to come to you. Nicodemus now, trying to view what Jesus was saying from the flesh and you know, they, there was re, there's restriction in the flesh. You cannot get back into your mother's womb and be born. What do you mean by that? Obviously, they were operating from two realms. This guy was in the flesh. Trying to understand spiritual things from the flesh. And even though he was vast in, in knowledge, not in knowledge of chemistry, knowledge of the law. The law that God himself gave. Because you can be a theologian and you know the scriptures from the intellectual point of view. All right? And you have not touched the reality of that which the scriptures is testifying about. It means you don't have keys and mysteries in your hand. No keys in your hand. No mysteries in your hand. But you can talk Bible. On the part of spiritual progress, the excellency of that part is not the ability for you to quote scriptures. Even though it is very good for you to know the scriptures. That's the way you can confirm things that you are interacting with in the spirit realm. Very good. You know, I don't want to by any means downplay the need for us to know scriptures. But I'm just saying that your knowledge of scriptures is not equivalent to your knowledge of God. And so Nicodemus knew the scriptures. But he did not know God. And then Jesus knew God. And for reasons best known to him at that time, he refused to quote any, any scripture. Except a man be born again, cannot see the kingdom of God. And then the man in the flesh, trying to view that from his perspective, said there's no possibility of going back into the womb. To be, that's the only scope with which he could consider it. Now that's the battle that goes on. That's what we become. That's how frustrating our life is. When we function in the flesh, we're actually functioning from Adam. Jesus said, oh, Nicodemus. All right, let me, let me try to see if I can relate with your level. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You cannot modify flesh. Just like the, the, the Japanese monks. They have more discipline and character than most of us. But they are not Christians. So we need to separate the thin line between morality and Christianity. Amen. Meanwhile, I must balance that statement. Because a man that is spiritually sound in Christianity must be morally sound. But, but we need to say something. That Christianity is not morality. And just in case you have a dress code that you subscribe to. And you are now prophesying it that you, you died, went to hell. And God said... Dressed like this, we we'll know we are speaking by a religious spirit. It's a deceptive spirit. That is not Christianity. Because what Jesus is offering us is more radical than even what the Jewish zealots desired. What they desired was liberty. But what Jesus gave them was an exchange life. The testimony of Christianity is not a changed life. You know that song, the things I used to do. I know you will pretend you don't know it. 
I do them no more. The things I used to. We used to sing that song and cry. I do them no more. Oh! That song is not a Christian song. It's not a Christian song. Because the summary of the Christian faith is in the book of Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. That says it is no longer I that live. Now the testimony of Christianity is not a changed life. It's an exchange life. More radical than what religious people look for. You know since I preached that sermon that you heard that day. Pastors, I don't know where they are, have been insulting me consistently. That I'm of darkness. You know why? They were discipled into religion. So they are used to the scroll, but they don't know the realm. And when you, you, when you know the scroll and you don't know the realm, you can add a jot and a tittle to the scroll and you will not know. But if you know the realm and you have touched it, that's the only way you can come, come back on ground and break the Bible into spare parts and show people where the deception is. You can't do that through Bible study. You do that by transport. Yes. So somebody believes that, okay, if I dress... Yes, there are lots of people that are poorly dressed in town, but the problem is more fundamental than the dress code. The problem is that they have not made contact with a God that is real. So I think our work as ministers should be to labor to see that people come in contact with God. We have been on crusades, all right? One guy came in with earrings and jerry cords, and he gave his life to Christ. The next day on the crusade, nobody preached to him. He had shaved and removed the earrings. Yes, sir. Amen. So why will I make my, the subject of my preaching for my whole lifetime how people dress do like this? When Jesus achieved that one, one night, on the life of a man that had a real encounter with God. Christianity is no more morality. Please tell your neighbor. Christianity, the testimony of Christianity is not a changed life. It's an exchanged life. Now, many preachers put people on interview on the screen. And then they testify how their lives have changed. That's not Christianity. Maybe he came for a crusade, he got healed. So he comes to testify, my life is changed. No. We never hear of people that were armed robbers, that their lives are transformed. That is the story of Christianity. I used to be in a brothel. That's what I do. And then an evangelist preached to me. And suddenly the appetite for this thing died. I tried to go back. Customers didn't even come. Ah. So I... I knew, I, would, I knew that if I stopped this stuff, my economy would go down. But a, a point came where there was no, I couldn't even think of going back. And here I am. I, there was no hope. And that's Christianity. It's an exchange life. Because even the lady that was involved in that thing did not even know how she became this. And that's the story of Christianity. Not, we, we interview people on air. My life has changed. That is short of the gospel. My life is what? It's exchanged. I'm not like my ancestors. I'm not like my father. In fact, if you start real Christianity, a time will come, your family won't know what you are doing and they will keep you aside. It means you are, you are, you are, not, you are exchanged. You are not like them. In fact, if you have not been, and if your parents are not enlightened and they have never had any problem with you, then uh, you need book time for personal counseling. Just book some time. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, so this guy was trying to understand what Jesus was saying from the flesh, and it was impossible for him to get it. He said, Oh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. No matter how many times you go back and get born, you still be flesh. Because the process was flesh. But you see, what I'm talking about is spirit. That which is born of spirit is what? Spirit. Do not marvel that I say, ye must be born again. So what must happen to you? 
is spirit. Spirit bent. It's on the spirit plane. It's not in the flesh plane. And the guy could not understand the spirit plane intellectually because he was not willing to understand it by faith. We are still going. He was not what? Willing to understand it. How? Now, if God permits and we have time and God begins to move here now, most of you will try to understand it with your mind. How is it happening like this? No. You can't understand it from that plane. You are still in the flesh. If you are going to understand it, it's going to come by faith. That's why the Bible says, by faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God and that the things that are seen were not made by things that do appear. Indicative of the fact that there's an understanding that you can only receive how? By faith. That is the understanding that drives your oppression in the spirit realm. And that is the kind of understanding you get not in the classroom. You are not taught that understanding. It is given to you. You don't learn it. It is handed out to you. And you must understand how to interface with things that are handed out to you. Are you still with me? In the flesh we die. In the flesh we are always faced with insufficiency. In the natural we are always faced with insufficiency. Anytime there's fatigue in the natural, you get tired in the natural. But in the spirit, even though Paul was in a physical prison, but he said the gospel upon his lips was not bound. So he was seen beyond his chains. There were some of the scripts that we read today that were written from prison. And those scripts have lived, have lived his, his lifetime in bringing inspiration and revelation to people. Indicative of the fact that if you understand the spirit gate, there is no level of natural bondage that can be a problem to you. Oh, you, don't, you, you didn't hear me. Okay, let me, go, let me go further. If you understand or if it comes to you by revelation what it means to be in Christ, Mortality and its attendant limitations is a light thing to bear. It's a light thing to bear. Are you still with me? If you are still here, say Amen. Amen. Now, so you hear several scriptures say things like this God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. It is true, it is yours. He has already blessed you. But you see, there will be a contradiction in your life if you don't begin to navigate by the Spirit to access it. Are you with me? Now, let me read two points on my script for you. First point is this. To enjoy in experience what is true of me in Him, I must learn to walk in the Spirit. All right? It means that, for instance, I'm called to be an apostle. I didn't know that for many years. And I was planning to be a lecturer. So as long as I was outside of the spirit realm, I did not have access to my reality. Because what God did is that he hid our realities in him. So if you are going to access the Father, you will do it how? Through him. If you are going to know yourself, you are going to do it how? through him. Now, such a personality that is the golden key that unlocks the realms doesn't need to advertise. Because just in case you get to the father, it must be through him. So he doesn't need to, to advertise. Just in case you find yourself, it, it must have been that you encountered him. So he put you inside of him, the real you, that is recreated in his image, is inside of him. Alright? And that's the reason why because of the way it is, it is cryptic. Your reality is hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden in God. It is cryptic because, so that it will not become common, something that the devil can counterfeit. So the devil has no knowledge of what you are in him. And that's why it's because you are in him that the Bible reveals that we need to seek ye first the kingdom. You have to seek. You have to seek that which has been conceived. The need for seeking is because there is a cryptic realm of things that are hidden in him that you need to access him to uncover. So I would have died from this world without ever knowing that I was called to be an apostle. 
I would have died from this world without knowing that one of the chief callings that God want, wants me to do in this day is to look at every form of error and bring judgment from the scriptures to correct it. Now, see, there are a lot of things that are happening. Boko Haram is here because there's somebody that has not found himself in him. Problems linger because there are people that the solutions have been put in that are found in Christ that have not yet accessed those dimensions. So, the challenge now is this. Where have you been operating? Are you, have you been operating like Nicodemus? Or you are operating in the reality of that which Jesus is testifying about? Meanwhile, these are two simultaneous realities. Just as the flesh was real to Nicodemus and he was trying to understand it right there, right at that time, in real time. Jesus was speaking about the spirit realm and how that you need to be born into that place, born into that plane, and then your spiritual senses begin to interface with a reality that your senses in the natural cannot handle. Those realities were going on simultaneously. So it depends on which realm you want to operate. Hallelujah. If you have a problem that you don't know the source, it means information is handicapped. What you need is revelation. Information is natural research to gather. And information is useful. But it is limited. And so we need to go beyond information most times into what? Revelation. Not every time. Because sometimes what you need is just to gather the information which is already available. And then you'll be able to help the condition. Most things that require information are things in the realm of the natural. Hallelujah. But issues that have to do with the spirit realm, you need revelation. And that comes by your position in faith, not your position in the natural. Now, so Paul gives us a discourse in the book of Romans. How that, what is obtainable in Adam, what is obtainable in Christ, what is obtainable in the flesh, what is obtainable in the spirit, and then he begins to teach us how to walk in the spirit. Are you with me? You must know the content of the flesh. Are you with me now? Yes, Alright, so if we continue in the discourse, this guy had knowledge. Had spiritual knowledge. Had everything about the law in his brain. And Jesus was talking to him. Bringing the realm from whence the testimony came from. And he was falling to that realm. He knew the logos. But he did not know the rema. The revelation that was coming from the realm that gave birth to the logos. He could not identify it. Because... He was accessing the Logos in the flesh. But the Rema could only be accessed by faith. And Nicodemus was not ready to pay the price for a leap of faith which would bring him into the same context where Jesus was speaking from. Because if Nicodemus had been brought into that context where Jesus was speaking from, Jesus, anything Jesus says, it will be a confirmation to what Nicodemus has experienced. Because he was also operating where? In that realm. If you are operating in that realm, all right, somebody can bring a word of prophecy to you. You have an idea of it. That's if you are, con if you are current, you have an idea. I'm not saying you have the whole prophecy, but you have an idea, a small idea that will confirm that prophecy inside. Because you are in the same realm. And he's not speaking to you from another place. He's speaking to you from that realm. The thing may be that where he's speaking from, you have not reached there. So the details he has gathered are more than the one that you have. But you have a little that can confirm that that which he's speaking is true from the same realm. Now, if Nicodemus were in that same realm with Jesus Christ, Nicodemus would have been receiving confirmations for little, little things that have crept in through his spiritual senses. But it's not the case. Jesus is speaking from somewhere. Nicodemus is speaking from another place. Are you with me? Now, Nicodemus really was confused about this born again thing. And he needed either a definition or an explanation. And Jesus had the opportunity to actually define what it meant to be born again. But he chose to explain what it meant to be born again. Hallelujah. And he said that the wind bloweth where it listed. Thou hearest the sound thereof. You cannot tell from whence it is coming or where it is going. 
He said, that is how a man that is born of the Spirit is. Now, wait, please. Uh, are you with me? Now, is that an illustration of somebody that just gave his life to Christ now? Say, the wind bloweth where it listen. You hear the sound thereof. You cannot tell from whence it is going or where it's coming from. So, is everyone that is born of the Spirit. And according to Jesus, his, death, his illustration revealed that this is not a high spiritual operation. This is a normal, normal spiritual operation. Everyone that is born of the Spirit should have this kind of experience. Hallelujah. Now we are going to trace this, ex this explanation that Jesus gave and we are going to see in what realm is this illustration possible. Can we trace that one this night? In what realm? At what point is this illustration that Jesus gave possible? Let me tell you something. If the causes Causes of your father's house are still manifest in your life. The implication is that you have not started walking in the spirit. If you begin to walk in the spirit, something different from what was done by the devil, what was done in the flesh, what was done by wicked people, your life will be something different from that. So that is what it means to prevail. Just walk in the spirit. Every trap the devil has for you is in the flesh. Sin, loss. He said, don't worry, don't worry about that. Just walk in the spirit and you will not have anything to do with the loss of the flesh. Some of those causes are tied to some sins. Yes, sir. Are, you, are you with me? They are tied to some sins. If the cause, because you see, spirits are more consistent than humans. So a lot of guys, and spirits have the advantage of permanency. Eh? So people went and cut covenant with spirits. Seeing that spirits are more consistent, uh, on the strength of the covenants that were cut, maybe they enjoyed some things. And the spirits will be diligent to administer their own part of the covenant on the generations yet unborn. So the implication of that covenant, because the spirit is involved, is transgenerational. Are you with me? Now, so the Bible acknowledges trans, the transgenerational nature of causes. Scripture acknowledges, acknowledges that. But irrespective of that, God is aware of all these things before he says, walk in the spirit. When you begin to walk in the spirit, you walk beyond the scope of the oppression of that thing, that cause. It is only on the strength of walking in the spirit that that thing that is written in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, where it says that this proverb will no longer be, be remembered in Israel, that the father's head saw grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. It said that I'm no longer going to operate on that wide scope. It will become personal. The soul that's in it, what? It will be personal. So you can decide to walk in the spirit and your brother refuses to walk in the spirit. Your brother has accepted the cause. And your own walking in the spirit will not affect your brother's case. It will be by your own decision. When you start walking in the spirit, you begin to see that the limitations of those causes will begin to wear out. It might not wear out just all of a sudden. Because your navigation in the spirit realm and your latching onto obedience at some points will be reducing the impact of some of those claims on your life until you walk free. The only escape route to causes and ancestral covenants and the insufficiencies of our bloodline is tied to walking in the spirit. But a generation has come in the body of Christ that have realized, pastors have realized that it's easier for you to pastor people that are not spiritual. Yes, it's very easy to pastor somebody that's not spiritual. Yeah, just, just come and say. You know what I saw now? It's an evil spirit. Now, to escape this spirit 
41 people that are being hunted by the devil, go and drop 5,000 naira. 5,000. Now, the man has no access into the realm. So he needs to do something in the flesh. So the pastor feels more secure when the people are not knowledgeable in the things of the spirit. Because if the guys become knowledgeable and the pastor picks a prophecy that is not accurate, they'll be able to pick it in the spirit. And the pastor doesn't like not being in charge. So different lines of the gospel have been emphasized over and above the need to teach men how to navigate in the spirit realm. So there are only a few pastors in Nigeria. I may not know about many nations. Been to a few. But I found out that the symptom that has overtaken the church in Nigeria is what is widespread in Africa. Yes. If something, if something is raining here, it means Africa is... That's, Nigeria, you don't need to... Do you understand it? So, okay. so the demons that are trying to tie us down as a nation is tying the whole of Africa down. Because Nigeria is... Is God's nursery. This is where it comes to raise the seeds that He transplants in the nations of Africa. So it's easier to give men false hope and say, next week a miracle will come your way. And they call it prophetic declaration. Check your Bible. That's not how they're declared prophetically. In fact, the man that declared like that was blind and he was declaring on the wrong person. It was Isaac. He was, he was blind. Oh. And when he declared like that, he was on the wrong man. That was not how God taught, taught the Moses how to bless Israel. No. It's not next week, a car week. No. It's not false hope. Jesus is not a money doubler. I need to show us the five pillars of the prophetic and then one of them is declaration. I will show you how prophetic declaration works. It's not the way. It's not. No. 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 By the time all of us begin to walk in the spirit, you will see that there is so much fake in the church in Nigeria. So much fake. And you see, if me and you become stars and we begin to walk miracles and go to the nations, we are still failures because see the, see, see the church. You are one giant that you have found God. And nobody else can find God again because you found God. You can't come and tell us how you failed. The times you did some things. So that we can learn the, how to navigate and the pathway. It's easier to do ministry in the flesh. It's easier to do it in the flesh. Because when you are doing ministry in the flesh, you are sure of when the next tithe will come. You are sure of when they... So their finances are in shape. But it will move into the spirit... You started by faith and you will have to leave. How? A carnal man doesn't like that. Now, let me show you something. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, we see the possibilities that are bound by faith. One of them is that the Bible reveals that through faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. And that the things that we see now did not come from things that do appear. Hallelujah. It means that there are some things you cannot understand in the classroom. You can only understand it by revelations that will come by faith. If I had time, I would have taken you to the book of Job and showed you some of those things. It was when God came to answer Job. God said, Job, since you say you are so knowledgeable, since you say you are so ancient, and you even claim that you could take me to court and you could contend with me. Well, I'm not under pressure to respond to you. But today, it is my good pleasure to speak. And Job said, so God now said, Job, go back to your library and arm yourself with knowledge. He said, give up your loins like a man. Put on your masculinity in knowledge and come content with me. Then he told him, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? That's why it's called the ancient of days. Even his experience will make you afraid of him. <laughs> he started and began to go, began to go. Then he began to tell Job about the spirit realm. He said, he said, have you ever seen the dwelling of light? Now, that place exists in the realm. But you, you will need an understanding that comes by faith for you to know that place. Are you with me? 
You are not with me. I've been taken to heaven a few times. That was why I felt the responsibility to challenge that so-called prophecy that came from a religious spirit seeking to enslave and ensnare the body of Christ. We, we know the God of whom we speak. Are you with me? We know him. Not just in studies. We, we have seen him. I have seen the place where light dwells. I have seen it. I have seen it. Hallelujah. Amen. There is a vast reality, a vast realm that you need to partake of. And there is no cause that can limit you at that level. There is no limitation from your grandfather's house that can limit you at that level. The thing is, kick start the process and begin the walk in the spirit. And be, let me tell you, the devil will haunt you. Because he knows that your, your access into that realm will deny him the privileges he has been enjoying. The first enemy you have to fight is not, is not a dragon. It's the flesh. The flesh... Hey. You want to go on a 40-day fast and suddenly... The kunu... There is as if it's calling. <laughs> By 11.30 a.m. you're already hungry to the death. Ah! <laughs> In fact, there's a time like that you... Your whole body is shaking. That's why you need to prevail. You need to be a radical. You need to be a radical. The Bible says from the days of John the Baptist. John the Baptist changed the texture of things in the kingdom. From his time, he became allowed for violence to be part of it. It was not allowed before that time. But from his time, violence was not, was not approved, allowed. To accompany kingdom pursuits. And from that time the Bible says. When the kingdom is preached. Men must what? Press it. So you have never pressed. And you are complaining. That your marriage is delaying. Ah. You don't like the way of the spirit. Because the way of the spirit. You can't pick it up from a textbook. You must search it out. And everybody is a learner in that realm. Hence. Hence the need to tarry in the school of the spirit. The school of the spirit are education and teaching processes that the Holy Ghost subjects us to so that we can become accustomed to the activities, the realm, the, the dimension of the spirit so that we'll be comfortable in that realm. It takes us through some form of tutelage. Are you with me? But there's something that Jesus said that is so critical that we cannot avoid in the process. We are talking about walking in the spirit. Are you with me? Now, Jesus said that except a man be born again, he cannot walk. So, in walking in the spirit, there's a pivotal factor. You must understand your spiritual senses. Every believer has spiritual senses. Now, you had, when you were in the womb, you had physical senses. Is that not so? You had eyes, you had legs, you had hands. But the use of your eyes and legs was not for the womb. Is that not so? You had to be born from that womb outside before those senses became relevant. Is that true? Also, you have spiritual senses. You have spiritual sight and all of that inside of you. But the use of those senses is not for the natural. When you are born into the plane of the spirit, those senses become relevant. They don't operate in this realm. Do you understand that? So when you are born again, then the need to interface with the spirit realm, using your spiritual senses becomes inevitable. Now, many of us do not know these spiritual senses. And sometimes, when the spiritual senses switch on, some of us call it something. Tell me, say something. Something. Something, say. Now, but the God's intention is that you'll be so acquainted with those senses that you know how to navigate with it. Are you with me? Now, I've not started the message. My message will begin from Genesis chapter 12. I'm just trying to bring us home. Because we are going very deep. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes. Something says, something says, no. You must know that something. And know how to respond to it. Yes. Now, basically, basically, on basic level now, we have four spiritual senses. 
on basic level. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 5. Turn your Bible with me. I said basic because these are not all the senses. These are just basic senses. As you advance, God is going to increase the senses. I will explain what I mean by that. God help us. Mark 5. Hallelujah. Mark 5. Now, play for me. I want to fly now. Mark chapter 5. We'll begin to read from verse 28. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Now, verse 30, please look intently. And Jesus said, And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, he turned, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Now, first of all, I want us to see what we call the sense of knowing. The sense of knowing. In order for Jesus to interact with the spiritual thing that was going on around his life, the sense of knowing was switched on. Now, you see, are you still with me? I said, are you here? The sense of knowing. This is a knowing that is not by learning. This is a knowing that is handed out. This is a knowing that is revealed. The sense of knowing. It's not intellectual, so you cannot explain how you know. You know by the spirit. Your spiritual senses are the only navigating instruments that you have in the realm. Because the spirit realm is like a wilderness. You need a guide to navigate you through. The name of the guide is the Holy Spirit. And it does the navigation through your spiritual senses. And each and every one of us, if we are going to be strong in God, we must sharpen our spiritual senses. Give me volume. You must sharpen what? Sharpen those senses. I don't know, when I was much younger in the Lord, I was not such a Christian that was doing everyday counseling, everyday counseling. No. Sometimes, I just come back from Lagos just to come fellowship with the brethren after the service, everybody would say, but you didn't even know I was coming. But this simple issue, okay, if you now say, okay, let me even hear what they want to say. The simple issues they are raising are things that if you have spiritual knowing, you will know how to navigate. These are not issues that are worthy of counseling. In as much as I'm not saying, I'm not undermining the need for people to be counseled. Most issues, ah, Jesus, you don't need counseling, you need to be taught. You must take responsibility for your life. The pastor can't know everything. He is limited. It's a measure of God that is carrying. Only Jesus knows everything. And there are several things that pastor cannot tell you. Jesus himself will have to speak to you. The sense of knowing. Should I tell you something? 70% of the speakings of God are in this sense. If, if this is the only sense you have working in your life, you will get to the end of your destiny. This one. All you need is the sense of knowing. 70%. I've met people before and when I shook them, I knew this one is not my friend. Just know it. Be very conscious when it switches on. You can be in the car park. Many times the difference between life and death is a knowing. 
and God may not need to repeat it. He just he will flash it. If you don't catch it that time, he has heaven as as powerful as heaven is. Heaven has moved on your behalf already. But normally, normally, because this is not the realm in which the context of heaven is. So what is moving mightily in the heaven, in heavenly realm can only appear here like a little finger. That's why when Elijah said, go and check what is in the cloud. Yes, Something is bubbling. There's a turbulent awakening in the spirit realm. Check. They must have a witness in the natural. What appeared to reveal that turbulence was what? That's how it is. The knowing you will receive will be so insignificant. But a spiritual man will have to depend on that sign. And if you miss that sign, it is the difference between life and death. Everybody that was not supposed to be part of an accident, that is a Christian, that was part of it, knew. They will always tell you, something say. Something say. Something say. Something say. Somebody wanted to marry and then... One week to the marriage, his peace left him. He has paid bright price, has done everything. See, young man, if you are wise, eh, walk away. <laughs> oh. Just see, pray in tongues all night, eh, and gather momentum. And what? And walk away. Don't look back. Many of you will say, why, why is it that God came late? God comes when he wants to come. He is king. You can't tell him when to come. I went to Kano. I was fasting and praying. God, what, why did you send me to Kano? Show me the assignment. I fasted and prayed for eight months before God showed me. He comes when he wants what? Gather yourself and do what? Because an abundant rain might only be revealed in the natural by a cloud in the form of the hand of a man. Second, I don't want to dwell on that. <laughs> there's, you see, you can't sense it. There's a, a turbulence. I'm struggling to preach. There's a turbulence. Mighty moves of power want to come to a crusade ground. The Holy Ghost will just give a sign. If you miss that sign, you have missed that power. If, if, you, if, as, if you as much as knelt down and said, Holy Ghost, come for this meeting, he will come. But the point is this, will you know when he will come? He will come. He doesn't take time to involve God in a matter that is his will. doesn't take time. I've seen it. I've, many times I've been weak from work and then I, want to, I need to go and preach. I'll just lie down and say, Holy Ghost, ah, Please come. And when I say that, I know he will come. So I'm on the pulpit preaching and waiting. I'm just talking some stories and waiting. And then when he comes, he just gives a sign. One sign, another sign. Then he will just wait. I say, oh, you have come. <laughs> the service which is on. The knowing, the sense of knowing. 70% of God's speaking is in that sense. Hallelujah. Maybe one week to the time of your marriage, your wife now makes you so angry. And you'll say, yes, I'm going to break it. I'm going. Then you go back and you, you now spoke in tongues. And then the knowing now came stronger. Forget that your rage. Go to the altar confused. Let your brain be absent. Go by knowing. That knowing covers the next 25 years. It covers the next 70 years. It covers the next 60 years. That knowing. And should I tell you something? Oh no, that, you, you can't handle it. <laughs> you can't handle it. You can't handle it. Ah, no, you can't handle it. I'm sure. <laughs> now, in this same scripture, Jesus received a knowing and Jesus said, what? Who touched me? So it is possible to touch in the spirit. You can touch. How? Because it was not the physical touch that led to the loss of virtue. It was a spiritual touch. So there's touch spiritually. 
I can touch you in the spirit. I can be praying for you and praying for you, praying for you, and the time comes when I touch you. I begin to feel what you feel. Well, if you have not prayed for people before, you may not know this one. You, when you touch them, you begin to feel what they feel. If God wants to bring the burden of a man upon you, he will allow you to touch that man. You can actually touch God now. Eh? We will do the practical now. You can touch him and know what you touched. You can know whether it's his power you touch or his compassion or his love. Can you differentiate what you touch in your prayers? You can't. You are not careful. It's the spiritual senses will... Have you ever woken up and then you had a song, you sang the song, it was the joy of God you were touching. That joy is what gives your spirit strength. That's what the Bible means when it says the joy of the Lord. It was his joy you were touching. Through touch, you can know what in God you touched. When you touch his power, there's a way you know this one is his power. Now, as I'm talking to you, there's an angel on my right hand. I'm not seeing the angel with my physical eyes. I'm, the angel is touching me. See? And I don't want to do this. I don't want to do it. Not for today. It's touch. It's touch. If we go on now, mm, we can't finish this service. Because it's, they touch. I'm touching. See? Another one has come. It's touch. They are touching me. You, there, there's no discipleship school you can go and learn this. There's no school you can go. And that's why you must navigate. People that, have the, that, that know God can guide you and say, this, yes, don't run away from this. This is God. They can guide you. But you will do the navigation. Are you with me? We don't you see. We are not. Just, we are not just preaching just because there's something called preaching. We were called by God, and God is committed to revealing Himself because of that call. It's if I kneel down and pray, I know He will come. I've been on planes, several airplanes that were doomed for crashing. I say, you know, we are still here. He say, I know, I know, you are here. It's all right, no problem. You have never seen what goes up there. <laughs> if that knowing is strong, eh, you can save all the people's life in your voyage. What do you touch when you pray? You don't know. That means most of you have not been encountered by God. You have not been suspended from the ground before. Just all by yourself. Not the crusade. Though. Just all by yourself. Just all by yourself. And then you are slain. Just all by yourself. You can actually see his presence has formed like a cloud. And then you can walk into it. <laughs> and then when you begin to move, people fall here. People fall here. You are laughing because you, they don't know what you did. You just walked into the cloud. I began to move in the suit of the cloud of his presence. What do you touch when you touch God? Many of you think you are praying to the God in heaven. Oh, my own is inside here. Uh, my own is here. And there are sometimes I pray, I pray, he will stand up inside, he will stand up like this, inside. That's when I become bored. Because it's not me standing again. He has, he, has, he has stood up. I become bold. And if he stands up like that and there's a cripple here, I saw you. In fact, I normally use it to play. I will kick the chair. If the chair I will kick, you will see the man walk. I know when he stands up, 
if he's not standing like that and there's a cripple here, we are behave as if I didn't see him. I cannot heal anybody. But if God wants to heal, I will allow him. What do you touch in your closet? What do you touch in your closet? There are times when you touch his vengeance and he wants to judge. That time he can kill. But he will borrow your tongue to do it. What do you touch? Jesus said, who touched me? Who touched me? Somebody touched now. Because there is touch in the spirit. There is knowing in the spirit. You see, it, it's, it's going on. But I don't want this because I, I need to finish my sermon. <laughs> you see, there's one angel blowing a trumpet now. If I begin to say what the angel is saying, then prophecy will start coming out. But I won't say that one. It's a realm. It's real. You can touch it. You can touch it. See, if you have ever prayed for the dead and, it, and, and, it, and they came back to life, you will know what I'm saying. That there's nothing in man. But the power that drives this realm is from the throne of God. And that power can bring a man's spirit that has wandered into the land beyond and commanded to come back. I have seen that. Let me go gradually so that we will not get into trouble. My question is what did you touch? What did you touch? Now, you see, God is so vast. Can you close your eyes? You will touch something. It's either you touch something or something will touch you. But I will ask you, what did you touch? Something will touch you or you will touch something. Mm. Can, you, can you identify what you are touching? Can you identify it? Can you identify it? Oh, oh, oh. 
comes here Jesus 
Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see. can't just sit down. My message has not finished. That realm is here now. Do you understand what I'm talking about? You can access it. It's for you. We take you beyond the causes, beyond the challenges. Just in case people normally have marital problems in your family, it will not happen to you. Abba. Walk in the spirit. But this is what you must do. Your wife, your husband, let God lead you to it. Don't go in the flesh. If you go in the flesh, it will break. Do you understand that? It will break. The cost will take effect. But if you are living in the air, an alligator cannot, cannot harm you. And so Jesus wants us to begin to navigate in the spirit realm. Now because of time, because of time, I have not been able to start the message. So we'll, be, we'll continue tomorrow. When are we continuing? 10 o'clock. So I will do two hours teaching tomorrow. I will start 10 on the dot. Is there sanitation tomorrow? Okay, sanitation ends by 9. So... I should be here by 9.30. Pray for 30 minutes. I start by 10. Alright? I want to teach you people life applicable truths. Because it's God's will for the least among us to be as strong as David. There are many people that have the calling into ministry here. Many of us sitting. Together we are going to change the face of ministry in this nation will change the face of ministry in Africa. Your ministry will not just be talk. There will be proof to show that you met with God. Hallelujah. In Malawi, people trek from Zambia to Malawi when they began to hear the things that were happening. And the local court of witchcraft now came to attack me on the pulpit. It was still through the spiritual senses. My eyes were open and I saw a red python. I said, ah, ah. Even the red python too came for service. And 13 of them began to manifest. And one was rending her garment naked. She fought all the ushers. So I told them, okay, leave her yet. And I was preaching. The anointing kept coming. And then when some strange angel showed up, we didn't need to pray for her to be delivered. She manifested, manifested, strange manifestation. And the demons left. So that means we depopulated the local court. I need to say, tell you something, that there are sicknesses you have never seen travel out to other countries. We see sicknesses that are not in Nigeria. So the healing anointing must be growing. And all of these things, you cannot access it in the flesh. Jesus calls our generation. Say, come walk with me in the spirit. Come walk. Come walk with me. 
I beheld and lo, the fountain of the great deep was open. And a whitish river began to flow into Benway State. And this whitish river began to water the young people, the youth and women. The whitish river made women intercessors and it made the youth apostles. People that were willing to go for God, go with God. The river began to increase and a few people were selected and were given wisdom to be able to tell other people what the river was doing. Those ones had wisdom. They understood uh, the river, how it was navigating. So they could instruct people according to the river. Discipleship has changed. It's no longer classroom. The discipleship that will prepare people for that revival is not classroom discipleship, not outline discipleship. I speak in parables. Because this river cannot be understood except you are standing in Zion and you have been chosen to be one of them that will instruct the people as to how this river was flowing. I saw that there were two other states in Nigeria that the river began to invade to. I, I, I'm not too clear about that, but I think Plateau State was involved. The other state, I don't know. Somewhere this way. Two states. Two other states. And it began to, and then the rivers met in the middle. When the rivers met in the middle, it, it blew out into the nations of the world. Young men and young women took the scriptures. Doors opened. The economy of Nigeria was fixed. The Naira gained value. People went to the nations of the world. And so when I saw the map, eh? You see Enugu State, Benue, Karaba, hmm? Plateau. <laughs> I speak in parables. God gave me signs that will follow, that will tell me about the timing. How many of you have heard me when I said that one of the signs that God showed me was that the airport will work? That's the last sign. Whether you like it or not, I came to prophesy today. That a revival that you have never seen, a move of God that our, our ancestors did not, I'm not talking about SU revival, not a revival in the 70s. What is coming down and God say, the time is short and the people are not educated. So that's why we are doing this teaching. Are you with me? There are many of you that will go into full-time ministry. Some of you don't know yet. When you finish laboring with a certificate, eh, you may never use it. What is coming here God needs foot soldiers. What you prayed for was not hopeless. Now he comes to answer prayer. He will give men stature. And I, I see that there are a few people that were giving wings. Wings. Because their voice will be heard in the nations of the world. Wings to fly. Wings to fly. The seat of the government of Benue State will be punched. I'm hearing that one now. It will be punched. There will be much bloodshed. Much bloodshed among people that are in the political class. The seat will be pushed. The man that will stand and rule in 2015, they don't know him yet. His name is not on the poster yet. Yes, sir. It's not on the poster. Strange things will begin to happen. Strange things will begin to take place. You know this river? This river has another name. We call it what? River Benue. No, that's not the name. That's why we have not been able to conquer that principality. The river has another name. Jesus. The 
That's another name. There are seven of us that we march to the bank of the river. Seven men. And we tarry at the bank from morning to evening. And the power that has held this region will fall from that river. And this is the time for you. We speak because it is time. We speak because it is time. We speak because God is, is coming to perform his counsel. None of us is strong. But when God rises from his throne, he can take a mortal man. And he can make him a voice in the territory. It doesn't matter whether you went to school or no. I'm going political too much now because I'm still seeing Abuja. I'm seeing Abuja because God is discomfiting the Islamic agenda. There were many plans that were put in place. One of them is Boko Haram. He's discomfiting it. And by the time we are getting to the end of this year, some of those noise you are hearing will go down. <laughs> because the time for the new season to break out has come. I hear him say, Rejoice, 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 rejoice. O daughter of Zion, for thou hast not been forgotten. Your voice has been heard in the heavens. Rejoice, rejoice. For thy time of redemption has come. The time of salvation has come. Rejoice, rejoice. For behold, I make all things new. Can we rise up and pray in tongues for two minutes? Just in tongues. I'm seeing commotion, commotion in the heavens. I'm seeing commotion in the heavens. I'm seeing commotion, 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 commotion.
Tell those people outside to come inside. All of them. Come inside, all of you outside, come inside. Just stand inside, stand inside. Up your right hand and begin to pray. has made attempt and you have gone through a lot of things because of the intention of the devil to divert your destiny the hand of god will come on those two people and then i will just drop the mic tomorrow we continue father in the name of jesus christ those people here that you brought here that the devil has made attempt to divert their destiny to make a mockery of their destiny and you brought them here i've seen that they have been through a lot of things and it's your good will in this service to, to, to help them out, to bring them out. I ask, oh God, let your oil, let your anointing, let your anointing descend upon them. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the anointing is coming. It's coming. It's coming stronger. 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 two people bring them for me just two people 
Just two people. I receive you back. So many attempts to divert your destiny. I receive your back. Thank you.